in the world of YouTube, sometimes some people watch an entire video and sometimes people don't. So for those people that decide not to watch the entire video and that haven't read your books and that are otherwise not going to be able to reach you, I need to ask you the last question of the night first. And I need to ask you to tell everyone who is saying, this is it, I'm giving it one three minute shot to tell me what it is that you know that is so important that I should care about. So while I'm gonna ask you more detailed questions going forward, for those people that just stumbled on this and happen to be listening, what is it that you would like to tell them about the subjects that you've studied um, regarding climate change and the environment? What is it that they have to know that they might not be getting from the mainstream media or that they might not be aware of? Hit the red button, hit the button. Well, my book um, is about uh, a scourge of ticks and it is a scourge that we have let loose. We as a uh, civilization, uh, humankind, have um, basically abetted a huge epidemic um, of ticks and the pathogens they carry. There are many of them. There are different kinds of ticks. There are different kinds of germs out there. And they're moving around the planet because of the way we've adulterated the world. And climate change is affecting us in many, many ways. It is profoundly changing the planet. But for us sitting here, you know, Lyme disease and ticks might be the single um, thing that is most uh, impactful in your everyday life because it has affected our very relationship with nature. We can't go out into our backyards anymore. We can't take a walk on a, on a trail through the woods without facing a danger. The, our natural world is now fraught for me with fear. So that's the one kind of takeaway I would like you to have. We've, we've done this, we've created a situation that we have to have um, fear when we walk out our front doors. One of the very uh, most significant uh, things that could be done to help reduce the, reduce the rate at which the world is warming and, and ultimately help reverse the buildup of CO2 in the atmosphere would be to change our methods of farming, to switch from modern industrial agriculture production to agroecological techniques that work in harmony with nature rather than really always uh, in uh, conflict with nature, that instead of uh, burning more fossil fuels and using more fossil fuels because of consuming synthetic fertilizers and pesticides, working in harmony with nature, so reducing the, the, uh, the high energy inputs uh, reducing the amount of, helping reduce the amount of carbon dioxide and other, um, and other gases, greenhouse gases, into the atmosphere, and ultimately, by building up healthier soil, sequestering excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So that's very powerful. So the emphasis increasingly has been not merely organic, agriculture, but regenerative agriculture. Agriculture that not only is, is employing organic and, and uh, sustainable methods, but so sustainable in a far more ultimate way because when they regenerate the soil and help pull in and sequester carbon dioxide, then they're really creating a greater level of sustainability, the sustainability of our civilization itself. I think the short message that I would start with from the conclusion of my book is that there's no more future tense about the climate crisis. There's a lot of talk that 
uh, oh, we still have 10 years to change things or turn it around, et cetera. But if you look at past IPCC projections of worst case projections of where we would be today, uh, the observational reality that's upon us is far ahead in advance of what those previous worst case projections for today were. And that's a trend that's only continuing. So um, I think we have to accept that we are in the climate crisis. Today is better than tomorrow. And uh, it's just getting warmed up, excuse the pun. But um, we're going into a crisis that is uh, going to challenge every single thing that's on the planet that's not already challenged. And I think rearranging our thinking and looking at it through that lens means uh, accepting that everything in our lives is going to change. And uh, taking that in deeply means, um, I think, kind of reorienting ourselves with um, how are we going to live our lives today and what kind of decisions are we going to make given that we're living on an irrevocably changed planet and things are set to intensify in short order, not, not longer term, not talking about 2100, 2050, but <clears throat> abandoning talking about the climate crisis in the future and accepting that if you live in Australia, it's present tense. If you live in the Amazon, it's present tense. If you live in southern Louisiana, it's present tense, or the north, north coast of Alaska. Um, there's no more future tense. And, and those of us living in this little bubble right here where we can still kind of pretend that it's off in the future, that kind of thinking has to be abandoned. So what I do after the conference is I take all the videos, and we have 80 full length and about 600 shorter ones, and I give them titles. So I take all the YouTube videos, I take the original and we put it on YouTube, and then I take shorter ones and I give it a title. And I try to give it a title that'll make it interesting so the viewer likes it. And then every day I check YouTube to see how the video did. What gets a lot of views, what gets a little views. And after doing this for five straight years, I have a pretty good idea of what people respond to and what they don't. I can predict which videos are gonna do well and what are not, and what kind of titles they like and what they don't. And this is my conclusion. My conclusion is that people are very unresponsive to something that they don't believe will affect them soon. So if you say things like, in 2100, if we don't stop climate change, there's gonna be islands that get flooded, that's like saying to people, we're changing the, the paint from blue to gray. No one, you know, it's meaningless to people. They are not responding to future tenses. The one, and the one thing they would respond to is if we told them what would happen to them and what would happen to them in the next five or 10 years. Now, it's a tough question because I know we don't know the answer and I know we don't want to make it up, but the really most interesting question that anyone really wants to know is if nothing significant happened and we kept you know, creating fossil fuels, what's going to be different about our lives in five years, 10 years, 15 years, what, what's going to be different? How is it going to affect us? We live here in Long Island. How will we personally be affected? You know, I'll, I'll start that one since I'm, um, gosh, my head's racing um, with, with answers. Uh, off the top of my head, you know, one study by the end of 2019 showed that it, it's, likely that half of the people of India won't have drinkable water to drink uh, by 2030. So now we're inside of 10 years of that. Another way to frame that statistic is that's one-tenth of the global population. So you can't live where there's no water, so where do those people go? What happens in the places where they go? To those people in the food and water supplies, housing, not even talking about jobs. So you can see how these things cascade. Um, Closer to home, the north slope of Alaska, the permafrost right now, uh, according to a study released just this past fall, one of the doctors I interviewed, the scientists I interviewed for my book on the chapter on permafrost, Dr. Vladimir Romanovsky, showed that um, the permafrost is melting now 
at a point already that they didn't expect it to be at for another 70 years. So essentially the entire North Slope of Alaska where they're talking about drilling, not even talking about the dozens and dozens of, dozens of indigenous communities living along the coast, mostly the coast there, um, the whole North Slope of Alaska is in the process of soon to turn into a giant 30 to 40 foot deep cold slush pond. So where do those people go? So now we have American uh, uh, climate refugees. So these are the things that are already upon us. And again, you know, if you live in Paradise, California, and your whole town just burnt to the ground, you're not talking about this in the future tense anymore. And um, so the question is, I think, when do the food shocks and the prices hit? Um, and I'm sure we're going to hear some more along those lines from Stephen and the fact that um, already right now, um, like Mary Beth just said, that we, you know, if you really understand how dangerous the situation is with Lyme disease, uh, if you can't go outside your house, well, that's, that's impacting everybody right here in this region right now. I um, <clears throat> feel somewhat like um, the problem of Lyme disease and ticks pales in comparison to what Dar is talking about. But, you know, what we've seen is but a little um, hint, I think, of what's to come by virtue of this, you know, army of ticks that is blanketing the planet. Um, and I call Lyme disease the first epidemic of climate change. It won't be the last. And um, I think there's good reason to call it the first because we are talking about people by the millions being bitten every year, um, up to 850,000 in Europe, probably about a half million in the United States. Uh, it's in China, it's in Australia, um, it is um, global, it's in South America. And, you know, we see indications that it, it's just breaking out all over and that it's because something is happening to our environment, to our atmosphere. And <clears throat> we've gone through four disease transitions um, since the dawn of mankind. Um, the first being when um, we went from hunter-gatherers to farmers, and we formed communal societies. And that's when um, measles and um, I think it was typhus first emerged. Um, smallpox and measles. Then we had the second transition. And um, that was when, uh, around the time of Christ, when we started moving around more and trade blossomed. And um, when people started moving around, they brought rats and lice and fleas. And with that came typhus. Then we had the third transition where um, we went and we sort of conquered, um, uh, put our flag in the new world and brought all sorts of germs um, to uh, original peoples in those places. We're now in the fourth transition. And we are seeing decade by decade a growing number of emerging infectious diseases. And you can see from the 40s there was maybe 10, and then the 50s there was 20, and then we're up to maybe 80 or 90 per decade now. That's only going to intensify, and we have a large um, responsibility to respond to it but we can take a lot of blame by what we've done. So we really have to start acting because there are other ways um, be beyond poisoned water uh, that this is gonna manifest itself. You know, just within the last few years, uh, the world has seen, including the United States, you know, 100 year floods happening or through once in 300 year, some kind of catastrophic weather event, but they're all being collapsed into a few years. So that should be waking people up. And, you know, people uh, who don't live in Florida might think, well, hurricanes may be increasing, but it's not gonna hit me. But in the Midwest, 
There have been catastrophic flooding in western Iowa and eastern Nebraska during this last year that has really wiped out many farmers. Uh, really catastrophic events. Houston has been inundated at least once, I think maybe perhaps twice, but it has, uh, DAR has emphasized it's happening. It's happening all over in, in many different ways. And Mary Beth has just been also documenting uh, some very terrifying ways. So um, the urgency should be there. And uh, people really have to wake up and realize that uh, we have to make changes. And, and again, as, uh, as Dar mentioned too, um, even if other areas of the world are getting hit hardest right now, the repercussions of massive population displacement are affecting everybody. Look what happened with the Syrian refugee crisis and how that's destabilized in many ways, not just the Mideast, but the European Union and uh, and then immigration coming from Latin America, uh, creating many tensions here. There's no way to avoid the international stress caused by massive dislocations of people. And that's going to continue as the climate continues to heat up and uh, you know, water becomes more scarce and, and uh, arable land becomes uh, deserts more quickly. So we really have to, uh, we have to think globally, uh, very much so, but act very locally in a manner that is going to have global impacts. Okay, so let me ask you that same question again, because I wanna really feel that no matter how bad anyone talks about things, people are hearing that everything is 25, 35, 45 years away. People are having a very, with cigarettes, people understand what happens. People are having a very hard time understanding how they, what is gonna change in their life in the next five, 10, or 15 years. And it's okay if the answer is, you know, things will be stable, but I mean, again, people don't want bad things happening around the world, but it's what happens to them that the majority of people are most responsive. So I know we can't predict the future, and I know it's an, you know, it's everything affects everything, so we don't know. But if, you know, if someone, if you really had to predict how lives are going to change, are we going to be able to go to Whole Foods and have a store full of food? Is there going to be lots of clean water? Is the weather going to be stable enough that I could live there? Is the, you know, are there, you know, it's what, if for people in Long Island, in New York, you know, how in the next 5, 10, 15 years will we personally be affected? Our food, our water, our ability to stay healthy, um, just, again, if, 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 if people don't believe that they personally are gonna be affected, there's a good chance they're gonna say, yeah, let's, uh, someone will figure out some technology. So I'd like to ask again, as hard as we can to think, for people who are listening, how will their life be affected in the next five, 10, 15 years, as best as you could guess? Well, I can't predict that sort of thing. It's kind of outside of my um, expertise, but you know, I think when this starts hitting us all in our pocketbooks, when the stock market crashes because there's a huge international catastrophe, maybe that's what it's gonna take for us to respond seriously. Um, I was in Florida recently, and I was on both coasts in very nice communities, in Boca Raton on one coast and in Sarasota on the other. And there was so much money down there, and so many boats, and so many beautiful houses, and so many gardeners, and, and I thought to myself, this is just too big to fight against, because these people don't want to give up all those wonderful creature comforts. Heck, I don't want to give up a lot of mine, but um, I have to think that maybe Dar can tell us what the economics of this are, what would really spur big change, um, and how it will ultimately hit our pocketbooks. Yeah, it's a really hard question, because I'm definitely not into making predictions, but 
One thing we can say for sure, what I can say after a decade of tracking climate stories, studies, uh, and extreme weather events, and looking at the trends, uh, and I'm certainly not far from the only person to have written about this or spoken about it, that the one thing we can count on for sure is everything's happening far, far faster and sooner than even the worst case IPCC projections. That has been consistent across the board, whether we talk about how fast CO2 is, is rising in the atmosphere to the amount of melting in Greenland, Western Antarctica, or e the Eastern Antarctica. I mean, up until a few years ago even, I think five at the most, Eastern Antarctica was expected to even be impervious to, to the climate crisis. And now in the last year, studies came out and they're literally asking, is it already an irreversible melting? The last place that was supposed to melt at all. Um, we see everything happening so much faster. And, and you know, I, it's great that you mentioned South Florida because I have a chapter on sea level rise. And um, I interviewed Dr. Harold Wanless down there at University of Miami because Florida, that was, you know, in a sense, the microcosm of the U.S. mind job of what's happening on uh, the climate crisis where where else is there this pretense that everything's going to go on forever when you can go to Miami Beach at certain king tides and there's fish swimming across the roads and people put on their rubber boots and just walk through it like it's not happening. I mean, the, talk about the frog in the boiling water, but I think pocketbooks is, is one thing that's going to be evident where I think last year the trillion dollar real estate bubble that is coastal, uh, the coastal real estate of South Florida leveled off. It didn't grow. And Bloomberg, not exactly a left leaning publication, ran a story basically saying that long before the first drop of seawater permanently stays in the first house in a, a high end neighborhood of South Florida, the real estate bubble will pop kind of like the reverse of a run on the banks. Once everybody gets the memo that this monster is coming and that you can't stop sea, sea level rise from entering your home, and there will be like the opposite of a run on the banks or akin to that where people just, how fast can they sell their houses? And there's already shifting happening where gentrification happening in some of the higher levels of Miami where people with money are moving into these higher areas and pushing out uh, people because that's now, you know, projected to become the higher real estate. So these trend, the cracks in the fissures are there and they're widening every year. At what point does it just break? And, and I think that that's extremely close. And then food price shocks. Like I'm amazed the amount of flooding we had in the Midwest this spring. If we didn't have functional global spanning transportation networks where we can offset for now in this country, the crop loss and keep the prices manageable. Um, when, you know, the Arab Spring started from food price shocks, when enough people across that region of the world couldn't afford enough meals, especially for their children. I mean, it was started by a Tunisian vegetable vendor self-immolating um, in protest of food prices. And that spread across and all the way to Egypt and into Syria. Syria record-breaking drought years on end. Bashar al-Assad wouldn't help farmers. Everybody piled into the cities. Still didn't get help, no subsidies. Look what happened. And look what continues to happen. And so when does that happen here? What happens when we have a country, what is it, half Americans are living paycheck to paycheck? Double food prices in a month, what happens? Um, more than 75% of the Earth's land area is already degraded, according to the European Commission World Atlas of Desertification, and more than 90% could become degraded by 2050. What does climate change have to do with desertification? Both looking at me, I have no choice. <laughs> um, um, uh, Climate change is uh, that and human encroachment and intentional deforestation, like what Bolsonaro is doing 
in the Amazon, and he's continuing and accelerating a trend that had already been in place before he took power, but chopping down rainforest as fast as possible or intentionally burning it to uh, make way for uh, cattle pasture, for beef, for American and EU markets. Um, so human encroachment, but certainly um, with the climate crisis, when you increase atmospheric temperature, it is going to draw more moisture out of the ground and trees and vegetation. And then um, that a warmer atmosphere can hold more moisture until at which we have these amazing uh, extreme weather events, these huge floods that then functionally wipe away arable land, crops. We see this happening in Central America already. That's a big part of the refugee crisis uh, causing the crisis at our border of people, farmers that literally aren't making it down there. And this has been going on for years and it's going to get worse to the point where certainly well before 2100, if you look at projections, it will be impossible to grow food there. So where do those people go? Um, that's some of the way that the climate is impacting it. So, you know, huge increasing droughts of severity, length, and frequency everywhere. This is happening right here in our Midwest as well, followed then by uh, extreme flooding events like last spring. Um, we have farmer suicides hitting record levels. This can't continue. That kind of thing's been besetting India for quite a few years now and other places around the globe too. So I, that's going to be another huge impact and factor into to food prices. I'm ever the journalist, so I like to ask questions as well as answer them. And Stephen, you were talking about our problem with soil, and obviously that relates to farming. Are we going to be in a position at some point where we don't have enough to eat and we can't feed our own peoples in America? Well, you know, it's interesting. The, I mentioned that in terms of global warming, many, many experts have for years been recognizing that we need to be shifting away from industrial production to what they call agroecological, which uh, are organic or near organic, but there, there are practices that are much more in harmony with, uh, with nature and uh, actually produce greater f nutrient den density, but they build up the soil too instead of depleting the soil. So that certainly would be one of the uh, ways to start uh, guarding against and even reversing this process of desertification by building up the organic matter in the soil and creating healthy soil, which we need to do because our good soils have been eroding at an alarming rate. Now, of course, the proponents of, uh, of industrial agriculture, who are also the same people who often tell us we don't have to worry about global warming and we can just keep going on the way we're going on and uh, you know, burning uh, energy right and left and, and uh, drilling for oil and mining for coal, coal and burning that without, and lessening the restrictions on it instead of strengthening them. They also say that organic can't feed the world. And they keep making these claims as if they're, they've got the evidence behind them. And actually, the evidence is the other way. Uh, the evidence is actually demonstrating, to the extent we have it, and we have a lot, that actually organic has the potential to feed the world. And uh, it can do a lot better job of it, and it will make a far healthier and better world. Just cite you a few examples, because this is certainly something that we have to do it's going to be a major component of making the world cooler and more livable in almost every respect and creating more food and also very importantly creating it where it's needed in the developing world. And here in the developed world we really have surpluses and uh, and experts in fact the in 28 I'm sorry 2008 a study was published that had been sponsored by the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, hardly radical organizations, and uh, it was uh, it was conducted. It was a four-year study. It was called the International Assessment of Agricultural Knowledge and Technology, Science and Technology for Development. Um, it was conducted by more than 400 experts from 80 countries, 
58 governments have by now endorsed it. And uh, first it stated genetic engineering doesn't really have a significant role to play in meeting the world's food needs. Now that flies in the face of the claims of the proponents that we need genetic engineering uh, to, uh, to meet the world's uh, nutritional needs. It also stated we don't need industrial agriculture, especially in the developing world where it is not well suited and uh, it's just going to increase the problems. What it did say is, as I've mentioned before, it emphasized agroecological techniques and it said that's what can actually create yields and that wasn't just theoretical. Um, the, uh, there's been, there have been extensive studies um, let me give you a few examples. A recent United Nations report surveyed 114 farming projects in 24 African countries, and it determined that through the adoption of organic or near-organic practices, yields increased on average by over 100%. That means they more than doubled. Uh, further evidencing the widespread success of such methods in Africa, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food reported Quote, yields went up 214% in 44 projects in 20 countries in sub-Saharan Africa using agroecological farming techniques over a period of three to 10 years. And he pointed out that this accomplishment is, quote, far more than any GM crop has ever done. It's also been for more than any probably industrial, high, high input industrial has done in those areas as well. And he stated, we need these methods if we're going to meet the world's food needs. So, and also, as I mentioned, by meeting the f world's food needs in the most economical, these methods are cheaper. They don't require as many inputs. They're suited to, uh, to uh, subsist to small scale farming. They create greater nutrient density per acre. And at the same time, as I said, they they are burning less fossil fuel and consuming less fossil fuel in the, uh, because they're not using the fertilizers and pesticides that uh, rely on fossil fuels for their manufacture, but they also are sequestering more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as they build up healthy soil, which then sequesters more. And so uh, really, it's a win-win-win situation, and it can be one of the greatest techniques to uh, help stop and then reverse global warming. So uh, it's very, very important that people understand the importance of stopping genetic engineering, uh, you know, calling out the lies that it's needed to increase production, because in many, uh, there are many studies to show that it has decreased production and in several instances, and that we don't need industrial monocropping. What we need is polycropping and agroecological techniques. So right now, if someone came up to you, someone who was 24 years old and said, give me your honest opinion, do you think I should have children? Um, you know, what would you tell them and then the second part is, there's a lot more to ask you about, about what's going on with climate change in the future, but at the end, the real question is gonna be, what are the most important specific actions individuals and governments can do? If we could convince the government to make changes and could convince society to make changes, what is your list of the most powerful things that would prevent these worst case scenarios and give a different future? Um, <clears throat> I have a few ideas on that. Um, first of all, I have a, a fifth grandson due April 30th. Thank you. <clears throat> and I've thought this very thing about what kind of world my grandchildren are growing up in and what kind of future they'll have, if they'll have a future. So it's a pretty dire situation. Um, about 30 years ago, I was covering the construction of a, a garbage burning plant 
an incinerator. We used to call them incinerators. Now we call them waste to energy plants. And you know, it's been the American way to find that black box solution. You know, don't reduce the amount of garbage we make. Don't reduce the packaging. Um, don't go for the root problem, but build something that will take care of it. That, of course, are, is going to create other problems as well, like toxic ash and dioxin coming out of the, um, the smokestack. Um, I don't know if there's a black box solution to this. I mean, President Trump did mention recently he's got an idea on that. We can all have faith in that one. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, my idea, my little kind of uh, thing that I bat around in my head is we have to um, instill in the society, uh, ingrained in the bones, a sense of conservation. We have to use the least amount possible, the least amount of energy, the least amount of water, the least amount of packaging. We have to reuse things. We have to change fundamentally the way we live and the way we think. And I have always had a very strong environmental streak. I was originally an environmental reporter, I went on to be an investigative reporter on social um, uh, issues and so forth. And I try to instill my children with this idea of saving things, of turning out lights. And I um, can't say I made a lot of headway because there were so many forces working against me. This is a huge problem. This is a market problem. Uh, it's capitalism run amok at its worst. Um, we got to change that. <laughs> That's not a solution, it's a statement, but that's what we have to do. Um, kids, I, I think that, that's obviously an extremely personal question. I, I would never make any blanket statement and say like, don't have kids, um, although the most, um, I've chosen not to have kids and several of the scientists I interviewed for this book uh, one of whom I read about this morning, have knowing what they know about what's happening with what they're studying, have chosen not to have kids because they didn't want to bring them into a world of what they saw coming. Um, and uh, definitely the single biggest thing any one of us can do to lower our carbon footprint is to not reproduce. That said, um, I would not ever tell anybody to not have a child and uh, that might, they might be bringing someone into the world that we're going to need, who's going to do something that we're all going to need, the world's going to need. Um, that said, it would, I think, need to be a really, really conscious decision and with the full understanding that they're going to have to help that child survive in a world that looks nothing like the world looks right now. Uh, it's going to get extremely hard. Uh, everywhere, not just uh, the places where it's challenging right now. So, assuming that responsibility. Um, and then, uh, you know, with, if we had <clears throat> proper global government reactions to the crisis that's upon us, it would, they would not be talking about, oh, by 2030, we're going to reduce our emissions down to 1990 levels or anything like this. It would be kind of a globally coordinated government response akin to what you'd see in a sci-fi movie when nasty aliens are about to take over the planet and eat all the humans. Like that kind of immediate banding together for our own survival, because that is how far along we are in this crisis. The methane is already releasing from thawing permafrost. It's already releasing dramatically in subsea areas of, of the Arctic. Uh, from there, the the you know, literally methane bombs are starting to slowly release. And so that with uh, irreversible melting happening, probably already on the Western Antarctic ice sheet, what we saw in Greenland this last summer, where one of the leading Greenland scientists said, we're losing Greenland. It's essentially now on the way out. And, and uh, the question is, how long is it going to take? When, when this is coming from top scientists, then we, it would only make sense to have governments that are doing things like 
okay, we're getting off fossil fuels immediately and we are gonna start relocating coastal cities immediately and then doing toxic remediation of places in those coastal cities of what's happening uh, uh, according to what's coming. And instead, like just using this country as an example, again, going back to Florida, um, just south of Miami on the coast is Turkey Point Nuclear Power Plant. And um, it's at six feet sea level. And instead of decommissioning the plant, which would take years and getting ready to clean up the site, um, they're adding another nuclear reactor. Um, so that's what this country's doing in some places. And you know, we need to be relocating people. And that's what, for example, Dr. Harold Wanless, just to give you an idea to hold up against the inactivity of this government uh, and the Obama administration as well, not just this one. But um, sea level rise expert Harold Wanless says, look, right now if I was in charge, I would be relocating the entirety of South Florida. That means archives, museums, hospitals, schools, everything needs to be moved to higher ground. The government needs, is the only organization big enough that could control, manage, and fund it. And those people need to be moved somewhere higher up into the United States. Obviously that means jobs, housing, food, et cetera and then remediating all the toxic waste areas that are gonna be left in South Florida. Because if you just look at the sea level rise maps as he has produced and shows in his slideshows, um, basically with uh, you know, projections of sea level rise, uh, he said we could see easily as much as 10 feet before 2100 when the entirety of South Florida starts to look more like the Keys do now. And the Keys are of course long gone by then. So, that's knowing that's what's upon us and that's what's essentially already baked into the system and then hold that up to how governments are responding even some of the better governments in the eu um, it's still laughable the level of response that we're seeing today well i would counsel that young person to if you if you like children and want to be a parent, do go ahead and raise one or two or how many children you want, but make sure that you raise them to be part of the solution and not part of the problem, as the old saying would go. Raise them with feeding them healthy, organic food so that they are healthy, they'll grow up strong and won't be, won't be using uh, health resources of the health system. Uh, raise them to have ecological consciousness and social consciousness so that they want to help other people, so they will help support organic farmers and maybe even become organic farmers or become environmentalists because we need more people that understand, have the big picture. Teach them transcendental meditation so they are healthy and coherent within their psychologies and their minds and they can radiate more coherence. Make them, make sure that you raise people that are going to be creating a positive influence because we need problem solvers too. And uh, you know, we, we uh, so if people have that kind of vision themselves then they should have children in whom they can instill that vision because we need to pass forward wisdom and social consciousness and environmental consciousness. Um, Richard Oppenlander wrote a book called Food Choice and Sustainability and Comfortably Unaware, and he basically said that um, everyone should eat 100% plant-based diet. Um, there are other people that have also said that the production of pesticides creates uh, greenhouse gases. So, would, so many other people who have spoken at this conference have strongly advocated for climate change purposes to eat 100% organic plant-based diet. Do you concur with that? That would be very powerful. And uh, there are many projections and based on good evidence that if everybody were to, if everybody were to do that, uh, I think as one of the speakers on a panel uh, yesterday mentioned, it would free up um, so much land mass, we would have far more arable land than, than we need. I think it's unrealistic to think that that transition could happen 
quickly, but I've seen projections and they seem to be quite realistic that even if, if everybody, for, for instance, in the United States, reduced his or her uh, consumption of, uh, of meat products by only 10%, it would be a huge change, a, a huge beneficial change, and it would be one that would actually create a major, major shift in agriculture. Um, even if everybody, people don't realize the power they have, just the power of the purse when they make purchases in their supermarkets or wherever they shop. If they choose, uh, if they choose to, uh, I know many people who express concern about GMOs or whatever, and then I see what they're buying and they're, they're throwing things in their cart that have GMOs, pesticides. On one hand, they complain. On the other, they aren't making the simplest, most direct step in their own lives by reading labels and, and making intelligent choices. But the, the profit margins in the food industry are very, very slim. And so if there's even, I've read maybe even a 5% shift in the way consumers are buying certain products, that's going to have a major impact on the manufacturers. They take note of that. They have to take note of that. So it doesn't take much uh, for people to be part of that important surge of putting the money, putting your money where your mouth is, essentially, where your, where your values are. And if everybody did that, it would be major. We would that alone would ha would force a major shift in our food production, our agriculture, and then that would be a cascading effect. So, yes, it would be uh, very very beneficial. But I think we also uh, can run the risk of of coming across turning people off because if we're speaking to the average. American or the average person in the in the Western industrialized world and tell them they should give up should become a vegan They have to become a vegan right away They'll turn off because it's too big a change. So I would say Speaking at conferences like this That's a, a message that is received well by many by most of the people but we have to there's a skill in teaching so if you're, if you're talking to people who are not there yet and are still really wedded to eating meat and uh, dairy products, and then be gentler about it and guide them to, to at least start reducing, to change. And then they'll feel better and then they'll want to change more. Because otherwise, I, I think we turn off too many people and then we lose them altogether. So that's just, and I think in the age of Donald Trump, that's, that's certainly a, a an approach that is important because think of how many Americans have been badly, badly misled by the media they listen to. So, you know, we have to, we have to approach things in a loving, gentle way and not browbeat them or we're going to lose them entirely. <laughs> I, I agree with everything Stephen just said uh, and would just add uh, from a CO2 perspective that uh, the agriculture industry and uh, yeah, the agriculture industry emits, I think it's almost as much or even possibly a little bit more CO2 than the entire fossil fuel industry. So that's another good reason. So is assume, let's for a second assume that the gradual approach isn't working and there are very significant scary stories that come out over the years and people say, okay, we have a real problem, we really have to solve it. Um, we just asked you if we went 100% plant-based, if we were 100% no chemicals, is, there, is carbon capture a realistic option? Is going to 100% renewable energy an option? Um, if we composted everything, is that an option? Are there, if we all planted 10 trees a year, you know, there's, are there, I understand cooperation is difficult, but if there was universal cooperation and we could do anything, what would actually work? Is, is there anything that if everyone was willing to do would actually work and is carbon capture a real thing? Carbon capture technology exists, but the amount that it would need to be scaled to to have any significant mitigation with the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is, uh, it'd have to be scaled to the millions of times, i.e. it doesn't exist yet. Um, the other, uh, there is another very, very cutting edge 
carbon capture technology called a tree that uh, um, already exists. Um, it's very, very easy to plant them. And uh, you know, there's a reason why that's been a symbol of Earth Day and environmentalism as long as it has, because uh, if, if we could just leave old growth forests alone, create more wild lands, do engage in the kind of farming that Stephen has talked about uh, on a mass scale, that would have significant mitigation impacts. Um, it, but it would need to be on a level that was government mandated and supported, uh, which would be another one of those uh, kind of pipe dream government responses to the crisis. Um, but all the other efforts, whether it's planting trees or um, regenerative agriculture or recycling or reducing all of our own carbon footprint and increasing the amount of renewables used, my answer to that is always yes and. It's all of it, yes, more, and everything else that we can think of and things that we haven't even thought of yet. But it's, it's an all hands on deck moment and time is against us. So everything counts. And you know what I talked about this morning is despite how bleak and overwhelming the overall situation is climate wise and politically, especially in this country right now, um, we have a moral obligation to do all these things regardless of how bleak it looks and whether we, it, it looks as though nothing might be enough or whatever. We have a moral obligation to do all these things and more no matter what, full stop. You know, I, I remain optimistic that uh, we can meet the challenge. Consider what happened uh, here in the United States in meeting the challenge of World War II. The US was really, the military was very undeveloped when uh, that conflict started. Um, and uh, the turnaround in the industrial capacity just by everybody recognizing a common threat, the turnaround of, of American industry, the speed at which warships and airplanes began to be turned out and it didn't take too long was astounding. And, uh, and it was the home front too, it was victory gardens. People were growing, you know, turning their backyards into vegetable gardens. Food was rationed. There were drastic rations of meat and sugar, gasoline. So people, because people recognized a threat and the, the mass, the collective creative intelligence was amazing. And, uh, and then after the world, the Marshall Plan that helped rebuild Europe and really feed starving people, and that was major too. So there are examples of really fantastic things that might not have been able to be predicted that have been accomplished when there's a common will, because human creativity is probably the best and the most valuable and least developed natural resource we have. And that's one we all have. So I think that, again, when human creative potential is applied in the proper way, and it has to be properly motivated, then it can happen. So that's why you know, this conference and others like it, and, and you know, people like panelists here and the other speakers here, we're raising awareness in each in our own area and through what we, what we hold dear, what we can speak about the best, and it's having an effect. And uh, hopefully the people that hear it, I think the people listening to this, don't, just don't hold it in. Start sharing the knowledge, encouraging people to change their buying habits when it comes to food or whatever habits. Start doing a, a garden yourself, and there's so many urban gardens starting, which is a very uh, encouraging, uh, encouraging uh, development and planting trees, and it's not just trees. I read recently that actually grasslands in many ways can be at least as good at sequestering carbon as forests. And unfortunately in Brazil, they're turning their gr vast savanna grasslands uh, into soy fields too, <laughs> burning them off. So we have to be aware of all of the natural treasures we have and all of the natural resources and use them wisely. And I think if we do, just, uh, we should be inspired by what has been accomplished in the past and know we can do much better now because our scientific knowledge is better.
I guess the question is, what <clears throat> is it going to take for us to collectively decide that we need to do, we need to do, uh, agree <laughs> that we have to do something very big? Um, we live in such a polarized um, time in terms of politics, in terms of issues. Um, we have this um, idea of American entitlement that you know we should be able to have exactly what we want to have. And our leaders, at least some of uh, them, <laughs> have really fostered that and assured us that everything's going to be fine. Um, we can have our cake and eat it too. So, you know, I, I get very frustrated by the, you know, sort of one step forward, two step back thing that our, our government often does when an administration <laughs> changes. Um, we have, um, you know, good um, things on the books. For example, I bought a plug in Prius last year and I got a $4,000 break on my federal taxes. That's pretty cool. Um, I got uh, a break on some uh, about 10 um, solar panels that I added to my house because the government was encouraging me to do that through a financial incentive. Um, I'm told that the car incentives are going to be phased out. Um, you know, how are we going to elect the, the leaders we deserve to make this change? across the board. So I'd like to ask two things. One, um, the world's insects are hurtling down the path to extinction, threatening a catastrophic collapse of nature's ecosystems, according to the first global scientific review. More than 40% of insect species are declining, and a third are endangered, the analysis found. So that's the first comment. Second comment is, so, so they're saying that insect species are crashing and we're losing insects. So I guess the question is, with insects, with pollinators, with earthworms, um, with microbes in the soil, what is going to be different and will there be large snakes in Long Island. I mean, are we saying that it's going to get so warm that we're going to have malaria here, that I'm going to go outside and a snake that could never have survived uh, could, be in, could be in Long Island? Um, what are we saying is going to happen with the insects, the bees, the snakes, the earthworms, the viruses, the microbes? What, what should we expect um, if nothing changes in the next 10 years in this area for people who live in Long Island? Well, I can address ticks on that question. <laughs> and we have tons and tons of this new tick on Long Island called the Lone Star Tick, which formerly lived very happily, and not many of them, um, in the um, steamy southern climes of you know Georgia and the Carolinas and so forth. And that's where it stayed pretty much. And um, it is moving rapidly north and west um, and it's on Long Island now, and it's actually chasing people off of their properties and uh, off their lawns uh, in the Hamptons. I've heard of houses being put up for sale because there's so many Lone Star ticks. Um, it bites you, and seven or eight weeks later, you have uh, anaphylactic shock response, an allergic response to mammal meat. Um, mm. And there have been hundreds of cases in Long Island of this, and this is happening in many other countries as well. It's a very new thing. Um, so if that's kind of a hint of what's to come, um, it probably is going to get worse. <laughs> um, we're also losing a lot of insects, though, as you say. Um, there was a time, um, somebody mentioned to me uh, at this conference, driving through the mountains of the Adirondacks in New York State, and your windshield would be speckled with insects. And you know, I hadn't thought about that, but that hasn't happened to me in a very long time. There's something going on out there. Can you talk about, I mean, any climate implications with the coronavirus? Um, I have not read any climate implications yet. Um, I'm closely following that, it 
um, obviously has moved very fast from China uh, to some, you know, a handful of cases here. Um, it's of great concern. Um, but it seems to be, you know, caused by these awful um, animal markets that they have in China, um, where they eat bat soup and things like that, one of the speakers said the other day. So, no, I haven't heard that. Regarding our oceans, coral reefs, ocean acidification, what are these, how is climate change affecting it, and how does this affect us? I, I, did, read, I did hear someone once say that we get um, our oxygen from the ocean, or, and that if the ocean dies, we don't have all this oxygen. So could you explain why ocean, what ocean acidification is, how it affects the ocean, the fish, the coral reefs, and, um, and why this is something that we should be concerned about if, if that and forests are the main producers of oxygen? Um, there's some notes that I have. In December, a study showed the planet's oceans are rapidly deoxygenating, de with some areas in the tropics having already lost 40 to 50 percent of their oxygen. Uh, land, another landmark report showed no matter how much emissions are cut, extreme sea level events that used to occur once per century will happen every single year by 2050. Um, that's, uh, the last six years in a row, each successive year has been a record warm year for the oceans. Um, the second big factor in sea level rise behind melting ice is thermal expansion of the oceans as water warms, it takes up more space. 93.4% um, of all the heat that we've added to the atmosphere has been absorbed into the oceans, half of that since 1997. You're not going to get that heat out of the oceans. That's why I feel confident in saying that we are we have a minimum of 3C warming that's already baked into the system. Um, and that's what we have to start preparing for and adapting for. Um, acidification, uh, alongside that, the oceans are dramatically absorbing uh, CO2 from the atmosphere. And that's why we have, I saw a, a study up from where I live in the Pacific Northwest, that the shells of Dungeness crabs are literally dissolving. Now, that's how much the acidification is impacting where I live up nearby Seattle. So that's a huge problem. And a 2011 NOAA study warned that at current trajectories of warming and other factors, that by 2050, it was possible we wouldn't have any functional coral reefs left on the planet. And several of the scientists I interviewed for the coral reef chapter in my book um, said that they thought that study was far too conservative, that it would, it would happen long before then. And we just have to look at the Great Barrier Reef um, as example, which I also wrote about where um, one of the most shocking things I saw recently on that, aside from the fact that the last several years in a row it's seen major coral bleaching events, but um, uh, when was that? Uh, anyway, it was sometime this fall a study was published showing that the reef had suffered an 89% of collapse in new coral after its bleaching events of 2016 and 17. So that means that as the reef dies, it's basically starting to not come back. And many of the leading scientists studying the reef in Australia don't expect it to be there by 2030. And that's the single biggest coral reef on the planet. So that gives you an idea how fast things are, are changing in the oceans. Do you see any positive signs in terms of grassroots organizing that is making a difference? Give us a little bit of hope, maybe, that, that somebody's going to lead us out of this? Well, um, one thing that I, a very interesting trend that has, it, it's been in motion, but it, I've seen it highlighted even in a Guardian story today about uh, what Aboriginal people are talking about in Australia. And they're basically saying, look, if you had, we have been stewards of this land for tens of thousands of years, and uh, granted, they didn't have climate, the climate crisis like we've generated, but um, there's literally been areas in Australia right in the middle of where fires were that didn't burn at all. 
and it happened to be land that was managed by Aboriginal people. And it's because they knew how to be stewards of the land and take care of it in a way so that it wasn't set up when wildfires came through that this would happen. And so uh, there's indigenous-led movements already in the states. I know of one, for example, a, a, a good friend of mine in California is tracking, who's also, a, he's a Native American elder of seed planting where Native youth are, and when I say youth, I, it's all relative, right? So people in their 20s or 30s are, are um, getting seeds that they know need to come back or need help migrating further north as temperatures change. And they're literally already just doing it. And, and, and I know literally these like gorilla seed planting operations, not by the native people, but I know other non-native people that literally are just, look, government's not gonna do it, so we're gonna just start doing it. And they're going up on both public and private lands wherever and just helping plants migrate and stay ahead of the game. So there are, there are some grassroots movements like that, but I think in the future that there's this big trend now of people coming back to uh, indigenous people and saying, look, okay, you had it, you, you, you uh, just finally understanding like, look, you've had it right for thousands and thousands of years. This last 400 years is this huge aberration. And so that's why there's a big movement back. I'm seeing it in this country towards uh, indigenous people to, to help and support and work with them uh, so that they can lead us back into a better way of living in harmony with the planet. If we want to avoid ticks completely, where can we move to where we would not be affected by that and at the same time would have the, be the last people to be affected by climate change? Well, there are few um, states in the Union that are completely tick-free. Um, but there are certainly places in the middle of the desert <laughs> you're not going to find a lot of ticks. Um, ticks need a certain amount of moisture and cover um, of foliage uh, in order to survive. There has to be um, an ecosystem that they um, can, uh, s that their lives can be supported by. Uh, they need small mammals and so forth. Um, but yeah, I think somewhere that's very dry, um, these deserts that are increasingly um, forming <laughs> may be one solution to the tick crisis, um, but it, certainly that's no solution at all. Um, Dar, you had previously mentioned the word feedback loops and talked about methane being released. Do you want to expand on that and just tell us what a feedback loop is and why that concerns you? Uh, feedback loop, uh, the I would imagine most folks in this audience are aware, but the most commonly used example is the Arctic summer sea ice. It acts like a giant mirror reflecting most of the sun's radiation back into space, but as the, the atmosphere warms and the seawater warms, the ice shrinks, so leaving more dark ocean exposed, which absorbs more sunlight, which warms it faster, which shrinks more ice, which warms it faster, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So an, one scientist, Dan Fagri at USGS, scientists at Glacier National Park had the greatest definition of a feedback loop, which is the more something happens, the more something happens. Um, cuts to the chase, really. Um, there's dozens of them that are already kicked in, uh, one of them being the thawing terrestrial permafrost, which is then uh, releasing more CO2 and lesser methane into the atmosphere, which warms it, which thaws the permafrost, which releases more, et cetera, and then the subsea methane. So I had a whole chapter um, on, on permafrost and subsea permafrost in the book. And disconcertingly, uh, I interviewed a scientist who's done work for NASA before and uses NASA satellites to track methane. And he, he, focused, he was at the time focusing specifically over the Arctic Ocean. And he published actually a peer, he, he co-authored a peer-reviewed study it was published in either 2011 or 2012, so uh, quite, quite a few years ago. And, and the shocking bit of this study was that, um, you know, we talk about methane releases to come, again, future tense up in the Arctic regions, and a normal background rate of seeps in a thousand square kilometer in the area of the Barents Sea where he was monitoring was, I think it was two to 3,000 
uh, natural methane, small methane seeps over a thousand square kilometer area. And his study that was published in 2011 or 12 found 60 million seeps in a thousand square kilometer already in an area of the Barents because that's an area where warming waters from the Atlantic Ocean are coming up into the Arctic area and then, and then migrating around and that's one of the first areas that's hitting and warming and he, he's concerned and expects that trend to consider all around the shallow seas of the Arctic. And so that's the big danger of, of the loss of the sea ice and why so many people are so freaked out. Scientists I've known that were always against geoengineering are now even proponents of it saying, look, no matter what happens, we have to find a way to keep the Arctic sea ice there because we cannot let more ocean be exposed. We cannot risk the subsea methane. We know how much is trapped down in there from being released. So that's, that's a huge, huge concern up there on top of the terrestrial permafrost, which as I mentioned earlier is now melting 70 years ahead of the previous worst case estimates. So you mentioned the word geoengineering. Um, up until now, I've always considered that um, a concerning thought, that word. Um, what is your, your opinion on it? I'm 100% opposed to it. Uh, I think it's insane. I think, you know, we have geoengineered the planet by, by adding so much CO2 to the atmosphere. And um, so I don't think geoengineering is the solution to get ourselves out of this crisis. Uh, on top of just the arrogance that goes with thinking um, this system that we know so little about, let's put it that way. I mean, I, I spoke this morning about being in the Amazon with Dr. Thomas Lovejoy, the godfather of biodiversity, studying the Amazon since 1965 and uh, talking about how literally even today they're still discovering an average of 1.5 new species a day in the Amazon. And I asked this guy, who'd been studying the Amazon longer than I've been alive, I said, wow, we must know a whole lot about the Amazon, right? And he says, we don't know anything. You know, we've barely scratched the surface. And that's just the Amazon, not even talking about the entire planet, let alone the oceans, which we, we've mapped more of the moon than we've mapped more of the deep sea oceans. And we're gonna go geoengineer this one planet, knowing so little about it is, seems like utter complete insanity to me, let alone the arrogance. Could you just define what geoengineering in this text means? Well, geoengineering in the Arctic, they've talked, you know, one idea is, uh, well, let's go ahead and spread massive amounts of tiny white plastic pieces that mimic snow across the permafrost right up to the coast to try to start you know, we, we don't, what are the implications of that? You know, what does that do to the animal life there? Um, seeding clouds, um, s releasing sulfur higher up in the atmosphere to reflect more sunlight back. And the problem with these techniques are you might have an immediate response. It might, on the, in the very, very short term, um, drop the temperature down a little bit or stop it temporarily from increasing further but then that would be used, one concern is that would be used by the powers that be to just keep on with business as usual. And no, we don't need to make the dramatic effects, we'll just geoengineer some more. And of course, all the geoengineering is also itself extremely fossil fuel intensive. So however way you play that hand, it just does not end well. It's that black box solution that we're so fond of. Yep. Okay. Um, I would like to open it up to questions from the audience, but one, please make sure you have the microphone. Two, please be conscious to speak for 30 seconds and let the speakers speak. Um, just please keep the questions direct and ask them questions. That would work out best, okay? Hello. Uh, I am a member of Citizens for 5G Awareness here on Long Island, and um, I'm sorry I came into the talk a little late, but I have a feeling you haven't talked about this. Martin Paul, Dr. Martin Paul, mentioned that he feels that 5G or e the EMFs, the electromagnetic frequencies, are impacting the plants and producing l uh, large increases in inter 
cellular calcium levels, which act in turn to produce large increases in highly volatile uh, flammable ter terpenes. And he feels that this is what is um, impacting or accelerating. It's an accelerant for the fires in Australia. I'd just like to know if you know anything about this. Because if you look at the, 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 the Australia, mo many of the fires are on the perimeter of Australia. And it would be interesting to see if the uh, infrastructure that they're putting up for 5G is in fact affecting, because it does affect trees and plants and biology and the microbiome and human beings and pets and plants and all of that. And I don't know if you mentioned soil um, as a way of capturing CO2, but if you haven't, if you could speak to that too. I think Stephen already talked about soil's capacity to sequester CO2. I don't know anything about the other issue. Are you interested in knowing more about that? Because this is a serious issue. 5G, uh, a technology that we know is harmful to biology and, and our, every living creature on this planet. Are you, are you, the three of you on that panel, interested in the consequences of 5G? Well, to the extent that, uh, yeah, that it's a risk, I, 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 I wasn't sure if, I, I couldn't hear everything that you asked, but if there's a concern that the, uh, that the uh, radiation might be having a negative effect on the soil microorganisms, was that it? Yeah, and if there is, that could be a major problem. I'm just saying if, because soil, so much of soil is living organisms, and again, we know so little about, about the complexity, except the more we learn, the more we learn that we have to keep soil healthy, and we shouldn't do things that are killing off the microorganisms, which uh, modern industrial agriculture has been doing uh, quite efficiently, unfortunately. And um, there's tremendous synergy where plants, a lot of the nutrient and the, the, especially the micronutrients that plants absorb through their roots, they're assisted in that in various ways by different microorganisms in the soil. And so it's very important to nourish soil and keep healthy soil. And uh, anything that is going to uh, reduce the, uh, the population of the soil organisms is not going to be a good thing. Just like antibiotics are not good for our micro, you know, our own microbiomes. Well, the soil has a microbiome too. <laughs> and uh, we have to learn how to protect it in nourishment. I haven't, uh, I haven't learned enough about uh, the 5G to know, the, the, but if, if scientists uh, who've studied it think that that is a risk, then that's something that needs to be studied very carefully. And uh, you know, there are all sorts of ways that we are messing up the ecology and we have to, we have to learn to live in harmony with our natural environment instead of always disrupting it which uh, you know has the cascading effect. It has the negative feedback loops, <laughs> and the more bad things are happening, then the more they keep happening. So we have to make sure we get into the positive feedback loops, and that can be done through regenerative agriculture in terms of the soil, doing things that we know are going to build up the soil and at the same time increase the nutrient capacity of the food, the nutrient uh, bearing capacity of the land so that we get more nutrients uh, uh, produced per acre and per hectare, hectare and uh, producing less pollution as well. And so there are ways that we can get into upward spirals as well and, and uh, we need to learn them and, and do them and then reverse, the, uh, reverse these negative trends. And uh, you know, that's a great challenge. I mean, what Dar has been sharing with this is rather frightening. <laughs> and I think if a lot of people who, you know, in the US who've been fed the wrong information for so long actually learn these facts, we might, you know, it might shock them into a more, more appropriate action.
Uh, yes, I have two unrelated questions. Uh, the first one is about uh, potential carbon tax. When I hear discussions about environment or global warming, I always pay attention to hear what the people have to say about a, the potential of a carbon tax to set us on a different path. And I wonder if uh, any of you want to uh, car comment about that. I, I haven't looked too closely into it. Uh, the, a couple of the broad brush strokes I know is that it's one of the critiques is it would be a way for industry to kind of pass the buck around to, from industry to industry or be able to just ultimately buy its way out of main, you know, continuing on with um, current behavior. And then how could we have a, a trust, a government that we could trust enough to actually implement in a way that it would actually work? Um, but I, you know, all that with the caveat that I haven't looked at it closely enough to really, um, I think, offer that much more than that. And I, I think it comes down to, I mean, for me personally, just taking re personal responsibility to actively reduce my carbon footprint every year, which I have since I started working on this book by living in a 100% solar power house, reducing the amount I fly and drive every year, and growing now all of my own fruit and vegetables. Um, and uh, I, I'm late to the party with a plant-based diet, but I, I can say as of literally just a few weeks ago, I have, um, I'm on that path now as well. So, um, and I, I just bring that up because um, we're at a point in the crisis where it's like each one of us has to really dive deep and figure out what is our cause going to be, you know, and I see all the different things like the people addressing 5G and what each one of us is addressing and what all the other dozens and dozens of speakers in this conference are addressing, I am really heartened by the fact that there's so many be different people doing so much different work because otherwise it'd just be utterly overwhelming, right? To think, yeah, all this needs to be addressed and I have my one little angle. We each have our own one thing to do that we feel passionate about doing because it's going to take all of us. But I guess I take a little bit of solace in just knowing that there's people like this who've dedicated their entire lives to what they're doing and now they're experts at it in writing these great and important books that are shifting consciousness. And it takes all of us though, not just those of us that get a little bit of public recognition for what we do, but all of us doing what we do. And I do believe that even on the very personal level of basic personal reduction of carbon footprint, what kind of food am I gonna eat? How am I going to spend my money? Just every one of these little actions I do believe matters. Um, while I understand what you're saying about a carbon tax, um, possibly giving industry license to do what they want to do and just pay, essentially, to do that, um, there is likely room, I would think, for financial incentives to get us out of this in many ways. For example, I mentioned the, the um, tax breaks that I got on my solar panels and on my electric vehicle. Um, we need a lot more of that kind of thing to make us all do the right thing, uh, to make industry do the right thing. Um, money speaks volumes, I think, and has a lot of power. Right, and I mean, just dovetailing with that, I mean, if you look at how much gasoline costs in the UK, and look at how much people use public transportation, or other places in the EU, I mean, people just don't drive anywhere near as much, and it's because it's cost prohibitive. Or look what happened with driving the amount of public transportation that we used in this country when oil spiked to $147 a barrel. Um, not too many years ago. I mean, there's this huge push in. So what if governments mandated that and at the same time invested in renewable public transportation and things like this? I mean, that's, that's I, I think, another good way that it could, it could go. I mean, and certainly the, the, you know, the general population, I think, would support that um, by a vast majority. Of, but again, we run into that roadblock of lack of political will, unless it's forced, of course. Uh, my other question, um, I guess, is from Mary Beth. Uh, I <clears throat> learned somewhere that the animal called a guinea fowl uh, lives off of ticks, eats them, hunts them in the grass and eats them. 
and maybe even just domestic chickens do the same. So I wonder if uh, we have, if potentially we could all be better off by having some of these animals uh, living in our backyard as our pets. It is true that um, chickens and guinea fowl eat ticks. The problem is, and there have been a couple of scientific studies on this, is that they mostly eat the ticks that you find in the short grass, um, which are the adult ticks. Um, it's hard for them to find the nymph ticks. They're smaller. Um, and the areas that they generally will gobble up those ticks for us are the pl places that aren't of greatest risk to us. So while they do eat ticks, and to have one in your, you know, a couple of guinea fowl in your backyard certainly doesn't hurt. Um, it will get rid of some of them, maybe break the cycle from these adult ticks um, mating and um, laying eggs. The science basically says they're not terribly effective um, in terms of curb curbing um, cases of Lyme disease. Oh, is it not true, Mr. Jamal, Mother Nature is not waiting for humans in the U.S. to make a plan? Talking about what to do is a little too late. And also, is it not true changing purchasing behavior on an individual oh, wow. basis would make a difference rather than believing someone else will fix the problem? I think it gets down to moral responsibility. And uh, do I think those changes would be a panacea fix? Of course not. Um, that's why I led my first comment with understanding that we are in the climate crisis. There's no more future tense that we're in it and today is better than tomorrow. And you know, from my perspective and everything that I've, looking at the broader perspective of tying in everything together that's happening all at once, that's why I feel confident in saying what a lot of scientists have told me, which we have a minimum of 3C baked into the system right now, meaning no matter what we do, that's what's coming. And if we look at what's besetting the planet today and up to this point, this is from 1.2C. We're just starting. This is nothing compared to what's coming. And so where we spend our money, all that, of course that's not gonna be the panacea change. But I think that each one of us has a moral obligation to do everything we can. And it has to start with some daily actions we can start doing right now. And it's true what Greta Thunberg says, you know, action is the antidote to despair. And I think it starts with even the smallest daily actions. And I personally can't look at the big picture on a regular basis without doing a lot of concerted action on a daily basis or I fall into despair and depression pretty quickly. And so I think it's imperative to have different things that people can grasp hold of and, and go do right away and trust that if all enough of us are out there doing what we can, that that's, that, that carries some weight to it. Um, one thing that I shared this morning that I try to remember to share every time I talk is a little kind of thought experiment that I heard from Stephen Jenkinson, a Canadian author and storyteller, and he says, look, envision Pretend you're on your deathbed, however many years into the future that might be, and that someone from a younger generation comes up to you and says, wow, you were alive in 2020. There were still uh, the Western Antarctic ice shelf. Uh, we still had most of the Amazon. Uh, there was still summer Arctic sea ice. All that's gone now. There's huge parts of the planet that aren't even habitable anymore. So when you were alive in 2020, were you aware of the climate crisis? And of course, you'd have to say yes. And then they would naturally ask, so what did you do? And that's a very personal question. It's, like a de it's literally a deathbed question. And for 150 to 250 species a day right now, it is a deathbed question. And we are a species at risk, very much so. So each one of us, what am I gonna dedicate my life to? Or it's like being on the Titanic. Everything looks so bleak. There's probably not going to be a magic rescuer coming. So how am I going to comport myself? Screw it. Go to the bar. Just get wasted. Well, go join the GOP. You know, <laughs> we, got, we got that covered. You know, so, um, or 
am I going to see how many people I can help into the lifeboats? Or am I going to build some lifeboats? Or am I going to just try to comfort somebody who's in distress? I mean, how do we want to be? I think that's what it comes down to. And the earth is the great organizer. The earth, her, she, that's where we all came from. And I just trust that if everybody really, really listens closely and follows the direction that come, we, we get from the earth, and I don't mean that in some woo-woo way, but I mean, I've, I've had my inspiration come when I've been out in nature, just ideas that come to me. That's how I got this book. And doing that has literally changed my life. And then brought in the next thing that I'm gonna do, which is a project working with a Native American elder along the lines of what I talked about earlier, to increase awareness of what indigenous populations are doing. So each one of us has that capacity and that responsibility. Danger be damned. You know, re results be damned. And so I get a little worked up about it, but it's, it's uh, you know, we're, we're in this life-threatening situation. And, and I think being critical of what someone else does or doesn't do is not productive. When this, this room is all of us are here because we care. And all of us are here because we're already all doing something or we wouldn't be in this, in this conference at all. And so the only question is how can I do what I'm doing better? And how can I do it in a way that helps more people? And, and for me, that means, you know, what can I do to serve the earth each day? And, and that's a really personal question in a time of deep, deep crisis when we don't even know if all systems will still be functioning tomorrow. Because that's the world that I live in. I get up and I wonder how much, how much long, this economy is gonna go another day, really? It's just amazing to me that all this keeps trundling along. I mean, that's, that's how I see the crisis. Anyway, I, I'm sorry I rambled a bit. I hope that was a little bit helpful. Um, I think my question is directed um, mostly at Mr. Drucker. Um, I don't know if you talked about it uh, prior to my getting here. I was a little late as well. But um, I saw a documentary on lentils and how uh, the planting of lentils, I believe it was in India, was uh, so restorative uh, to the land as well as to the economy. And I wanted to know, what did you think about uh, methods of crop rotation as well as planting lentils and chickpeas um, for improving the quality of soil? My hearing's not great, so I had to have some help from Dar understanding your question, which sounds like a good one, and I may not be answering all of it, and if so, follow up with me. But I did hear about lentils and chickpeas <laughs> directly and through Dar, and uh, I am not, uh, well, legumes, uh, <coughs> legumes we know can fix nitrogen, so that is, uh, that, that uh, helps build uh, good crops, healthy soil, uh, in ways that don't require the synthetic nitrogen fertilizer, at least that's my understanding. I'm not an expert agronomist, so if I said something that isn't quite right, somebody who knows better, please correct me. But uh, that is good in itself, and of course, lentils and chickpeas are a good source of plant-based protein and also fiber, and uh, so that's good. I uh, also, uh, seem to remember reading some studies, health studies, that there is, it seems to be a correlation between the consumption of, um, I think, lentils and, uh, and mung beans and probably chickpeas too, and cardiac health, that they seem to actually have a, a, protective, um, a protective role. And so, I mean, I've been a vegetarian since I was in law school, so I've eaten a whole, I've eaten a lot of lentils and chickpeas. I love hummus, and so uh, I'm quite an advocate for that. Um, one of the, uh, another thing would be by, by uh, if they're grown, I mean, the main thing is, and I think perhaps you mentioned this, if they're grown in an agroecological manner, then that's very important. A fact that I didn't uh, share specifically that I'd like to work in now here, it's from the uh, Rodale Institute in Pennsylvania. Most of you have probably heard of it, 
great champion of organic agriculture, but they've been studying organics for years and doing side-by-side -side comparison, growing organic uh, next to conventional and trying to keep all of the uh, things the same except for the, the methods in which they're growing. But they've mentioned that uh, uh, in their report, 20, uh, 20, uh, 2008 report, that, uh, that organic, um, the uh, organic, organic system can mitigate global warming because cover crops and compost can sequester close to 40% of global CO2 emissions. I have a feeling that figure is even a little low, that by now it, uh, it's been learned that it's, uh, it's uh, more. But uh, it's definitely a good way to go because I uh, said it's, it's really a win-win-win when we're growing things agroecologically and we're growing a good plant-based protein. And uh, many speakers in earlier <laughs> lectures and earlier panels have emphasized how inefficient it is to uh, convert, try to convert nutrients, you know, <laughs> plant protein into animal protein. It's what I think about uh, 10 to 1, that it takes 10 times, 10 times as much for every, what, 10 pounds of uh, plant protein, you get one pound of animal protein. Well, that's highly wasteful, and uh, we can do a lot better than that. And um, so I'm all for growing more lentils and chickpeas. <laughs> Did I answer your question adequately? Yes? She said part of it. Okay. Well, if somebody else can answer another part, or if you want to repeat the other part, I'm sorry, my, my hearing is not that great. I have a congenital defect that gets worse with it, uh, as the years go on, so. Just, just go on. Just like. Hi. So uh, right now, we are so dependent on the industrial agricultural system. And from what I understand, we, uh, only 1% of our food here is grown locally. Um, and I believe that like, everyone in this room or in the world has the power. Like Everyone can plant seeds and grow food. Can you speak to how important it is to increase local food production? To do the last part, can you speak to how important it is? That's, uh, that's an area in which I don't have as much knowledge as I'd like, but I'll just give a try and then uh, others may be able to chime in either here on the panel or people who have knowledge in the audience. I'm sure many of you do, but obviously one thing is that we, we, uh, we cut down a lot on the use of fossil fuels and energy to transport food. Uh, so uh, another thing is that <clears throat> by the time it allows the food to be more nutri nutrient dense because if, if we're eating it from a local area, it can be vine ripened. So it doesn't get picked so much food if we're importing it from Mexico or South America or, or New Zealand or China um, it's got to be picked uh, prematurely, and then so much of our food gets ripened in transit, and then it has to be gas to ripen. That's why, I mean, most people will say now that tomatoes, most commercial tomatoes, have almost no taste. That's because they are picked so prematurely. They probably wouldn't be even red unless uh, a lot of stuff was done to them. So. Anybody who has eaten a vine-ripened, locally grown tomato and compare it to a, one that's shipped in from the Salinas Valley in California or Mexico can taste the difference. It's just there, and your body feels the difference. Same with almost any fruit, any vegetable, and increasingly we're learning that some of the most important uh, aspects to food are not the normally understood uh, minerals and vitamins and proteins, but it's phytonutrients, many of which only come in during the last few days, uh, perhaps, of the, of the ripening process. And that doesn't happen at all if the food is picked prematurely. So that's very important for people to be able to do, to uh, eat locally. And there are many other benefits. 
but again, strengthening the local farmers. Uh, I live in Iowa, so it'd be great. Most of the farmers are growing soy and corn, and some canola, but mostly in Iowa, it's soy, beans, and corn, and that's, most of that's being fed to livestock. Iowa also has huge confined animal feeding operations. There are more hogs in Iowa than people. And, uh, you know, that is a, a very imbalanced uh, agriculture situation. So more and more, as, as uh, organic, small-scale organic is happening and people are supporting that through community-supported uh, agriculture, that's another thing you can do. Find a local organic farmer and support his or her operation. That really helps a lot. And you'll get the benefit from it, too. So community-supported agriculture is very important. I'm sure there are many growers on Long Island that would love your support, and I'm sure many of you are already participating in that kind of a program. And of course, doing as Dara's doing, growing more of your own, that's great, too. But um, the, the more you can, we can eat locally, the more healthy we will be, the more healthy our agricultural system will be. Um, I remember that in high school, the Westinghouse Company at the time offered scholarships to interested and, and eager high school students who were creative and wanted an outlet for their creativity. And I was wondering whether uh, you knew of any companies that might offer scholarships to bright high school students or college engineering students. Um, to give an incentive to look and see if they could combine methane and carbon dioxide with some other elements, some other substances that might bring another thing to, to bear, it, to come into the world, that they might be able to use as a building construction for, all, for so many homeless people if there's a possibility to, to do something like that to bring the methane and the carbon dioxide out of the air and put it into, make it into something that might be productive and useful? Not that I'm aware of, unfortunately. Anybody you can suggest it to? Or that anybody in the audience can suggest that to? Because we make new things all the time, so why not use as some of the building blocks, methane and carbon dioxide, and see what else we can combine it with? Well, you're talking about trying to harness our communal ingenuity. Yes, <laughs> That's absolutely. That's a great idea. Absolutely. Know? And I agree with it. But again, I don't, I don't know how it would be done, but it's a great idea. Anybody? <laughs> yeah. OK. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Jamal, this was, question was for you, if you have the moment. Let someone cut. I have to make a bathroom break. OK. <laughs> I have a, a comment and perhaps a question about the ticks. Uh, you know, we spend so much time trying to make new vaccines that are going to make big pharma rich. Uh, but the Lyme disease is such a grave concern. And now this other Lone Star tick. Uh, and the answer on Long Island to these things, is, you know, it seems to be vector control and, and just destroying the beneficial insects with pesticides. And so if, is, can you speak to solutions that are beneficial for beneficial insects or bringing in beneficial insects and bats and things like that um, for mosquitoes? You're basically getting at the um, central problem here of how do we control, how do we control ticks and prevent them from giving us diseases. And we haven't done a very good job uh, on that. Um, you can just see year to year to year the case numbers going up. And we've been telling people to tuck their pants into their socks and wear light clothing and put their clothes in the dryer and so on and so forth um, after being outside and check yourself and, you know, to little effect. 
Um, so what can we do? Um, as far as a vaccine goes, there is one in development. I'm not a big fan of a Lyme disease vaccine because... Neither am um, I. <laughs> the, well, beyond you know, the fact that it might not be very effective, um, that it might have some side effects, and the last one did have some side effects, um, we can't become complacent about ticks because it's not just Lyme disease. Um, there are other things carried by ticks that are very serious and that are growing. If we eliminate one pathogen from the menu of you know, what's gonna hurt us, um, something else um, will come along to take its place. Um, there's so something called an anti-tick vaccine that's also in development. I think that would be a pretty good preventative. It doesn't deal with what you're getting at, and that is the environmental problem of having so many ticks. Um, you know, we can do things like um, treat mice. <laughs> there is an experiment going on in Dutchess County in New York um, in which bait stations for mice are put out. The mouse goes into a little box, gets a tasty treat, and gets doused with a little bit of fipronil. It's uh, an insecticide. It kills the ticks on the mouse and hence kind of breaks the cycle at that level because the mouse is the single biggest reservoir of Lyme disease in the environment. It is what um, most frequently infects that baby tick that goes on to um, morph into a, to molt into a, a nymph and then bites us. Um, so, you know, that's one kind of way in which we could attack the problem. Yes. Um, killing ticks is a very, very challenging um, problem, and we haven't figured out how to do it. Do it. We um, know how to control mosquitoes because they're easy to find. They're just in the air, and we do use chemical controls for them. Ticks aren't so easy to get at. Um, they're in our backyards, they're under the leaf litter, litter. they're, you know, um, out of sight, basically, uh, in places where we can't really reach them. So there is research going on as to what we can do um, to uh, limit our risk, um, but we have a lot more work to do. And, you know, we really need to, co to protect our children. Children are the most frequently bitten. Uh, population, children from five to um, nine years old, boys from five to nine are number one, and then an overall children from five to 14. A lot of them miss, you know, months, years of school as a result of a tick bite. Um, so there ought to be plenty incentive for us to do something about this, uh, to invest the money, and we haven't yet done that. <laughs> So Jamal, thank you for coming back. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. <clears throat> so I think that um, that there's a part of the problem with complacency about uh, climate change, I think, is that we really don't fully understand the implications of what's happening. So like even, you know, I know something about the environment, but even when you're talking about, so you talked about tonight, right, that the permafrost is, you know, is melting, right? That, um, that all this methane gas under the ocean that's coming to the surface. You talked about the Great Barrier Reefs that are going away and 50% of certain parts of the oceans that are, are warming, right? But can you then say to us, like what I'd like to hear and to have on video is, okay, if the permafrost then goes away, what then happens? If this methane comes up, what then happens? If you know the Great Barrier Reef goes away, what then? And then if that happens, what then? And if that happens, what then? And then what happens? Because I don't think people really understand that. So when you say, oh, you know, the, the permafrost is almost gone or there's so much gone, we don't go, all right, so I got, I got 100 years. What's the big deal? No, no, we need to know if you can tell us what is the big deal. It's a good question and it's a challenging question. Um, I, I think rather than trying to answer it by 
projecting into the future of what happens when these different systems fail or do the things, some of them you just described. Um, maybe our problem is a lack of imagination in that, well, let me preface it by saying I feel very lucky and fortunate. It's easy for me to feel the crisis in the immediate sense in the present tense is because I've been to it. You know, I've been to the Great Barrier Reef on top of white coral as far as you can see. I've been in Alaska in places where I used to climb across glaciers that no longer exist. Um, I've been in the indigenous communities in certain areas that are having to relocate and watching their fishing and subsistence lifestyles vanish before their eyes. And I've been with them when they've cried. You know, I, I, I've been to these places in southern Louisiana where people are having to leave because of sea level rise. So I've had the privilege and honor of being there. So I understand, it's in me, I get it. And so, but people that haven't had that experience, I think maybe it's just a failure of our collective imagination and empathy with fellow human beings to just understand, like to see the news and be like, well, if I lived in Paradise, California, is what, 89 people died in that fire. Um, most of entire, some entire families perished and everything that they owned. Um, just to pause and think for just a, a minute that that could happen any time now. Like we could have a drought here this coming summer that could bring that kind of hell. Um, we could have a super storm at the end of this coming summer that could make everything that's come before it pale by comparison. Um, that it's, it's that failure of imagination, I think, to put ourselves in the places of these people in Australia. You know, I have friends over there that I communicate with. Is your farm still there? Are you st and your family still okay? You know, so um, I don't know. I mean, I think I'm floundering a bit with the question because I've, I've done everything I can to try to bring it home to people. That's why I wrote this book. Um, by going to these places and writing about it in a really, really personal way and try to bring that experience to people because I understand that that's a big part of the problem, especially in the United States where, you know, here we are. We have full electricity. We have climate control. We, most of us are fed and watered decent enough on a daily basis. You know, so in that sense, all of us right here, right now are in this bubble. And most of the rest of the world already is not living this way. Most of the rest of the world, you know, I mean, we, we are looking at a refugee crisis from sea level rise alone that the UN warns is gonna be two billion people by 2100. Um, we're looking at a, a, I mentioned it this morning, one study in the last year showed that half of India probably won't have drinking water by 2030. I mean, another way to put that, that's one-tenth of the entire global population. Um, we already look at places, you know, if you're a farmer in the Midwest that we mentioned earlier and you've had drought, flood, drought, flood, drought, flood, and you're not making it and you've just committed suicide. And, you know, like, where's the failure in my own imagination of not being able to read these reports and really stopping and pausing long enough to take that in and think about that person's family? How bad does it have to be for that, per that farmer to kill themselves? You know, that, that's already here, you know? And so, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I really struggle regularly to try to bring that home in a very, very real way. Um, you know, I've, I've been in my house up there a couple of summers ago engulfed in wildfire smoke, not even from fires on the Olympic Peninsula where I live, but from British Columbia and Montana. We've had wildfire smoke from LA come all the way up to the Pacific Northwest. And you sit there and you can't leave and there's nowhere to go and then that's when it really sinks in. Like, oh, it's everywhere up here. There's nowhere for me to go, like this is it. You know, and that's when it really sinks in to me. And I wish everyone, anyone who hasn't experienced it in a very personal, visceral way like that, you know, but then the question is, you know, hopefully we can do that and then still come out the other side of it because daily people aren't. I mean, one statistic I shared this morning is every minute, two people, um, no, it's every two minutes, one person is a new climate refugee somewhere on the planet. So it's a failure of imagination for me to not really take that in and know that I could be next. You know?
I know that's not necessarily a complete or direct answer, but it's the best I got right now. What kind of job is the media doing in terms of covering this? You mentioned South Florida being underwater. What, uh, my um, sister and brother-in-law live there in South Florida, and they're not terribly concerned about it. Um, is it being covered regularly down there? For the most part, no. And yet at the same time, and this is the schizophrenic situation, at the same time, there's certain regional banks in South Florida that will no longer issue 30-year mortgages. So that will be another weird iteration of how finances dictate behavior and change and why some rich people living right on the coast in that high dollar property are starting to move into other places in Miami that used to be completely unappealing to them, but now they're at 15 feet. So those property values are starting to go through the roof. I mean, there's gonna be you know, financial incentive driving things, um, just like in the food sector. You know, if, if, if we can, when people understand the real costs of things, then they're gonna start behaving differently. And ultimately, you know, that's another thing now is like, right, we're, we're still in this time period, a lot of us, where we can still make choices about what to do and what not to do. And this is a grace period, you know, and, and we'll get to a point where we don't have choices. So what we do now determines how hard that transition is gonna be. Because most people on the planet right now do not have choices like what we have, you know? If you live on the Delta in Bangladesh, no. If you live in parts of Jakarta where they're gonna, you know, Indonesia's relocating their entire capital city because in less than 10 years, 25% of it will be underwater and parts of the airport are already going underwater right now, right? Failure of imagination plus the media that tells us the opposite, or doesn't, does, or, or just sugarcoats it at best. Yes, thank you. Um, listening to you now reminds me of the great Patty Chayefsky, the late great Patty, and his spin in network, uh, mad as hell, and I'm not gonna take it. Yes, we know things are bad. And I think that the comments here, a lot of us are incentivized if we're not already doing everything we can. I know I am. But we're not speaking too much about government and we barely address the geoengineering. And also there's a lot of evidence that uh, the ticks are germ warfare. Introduced prior to the finding of a better weapon against the Japanese, if you can call that better. In any event, uh, if they made it, they can fix it. They've got um, lies and more lies. We don't know the truth about the solar minimum. We don't know the truth about the magnetic field shift. All these things impact weather. Uh, the latest spin I heard from one of my heroes, Doc Wallach, concerning the coral reefs and the damming of the rivers, which are eliminating the silt nutrients. Corals need those nutrients to survive. Take that out. And uh, you don't have that uh, photosynthesis, and then you get uh, differentials in the carbon dioxide, consequently fires. Fires are also due to the geoengineering spraying of nanoparticles of barium, strontium, and helium, all lethal to humans, trees, insects, bees, so I guess I'd ask if you have a specific question. <coughs> well, I, well, I'm trying to, I, these were not brought up. I think the government is a big uh, cause of this. We do need to blame ourselves, but I think that they're definitely sponsoring a lot of this. I think we need a global corporate boycott in order to stop all of the affronts to our well-being, our health, our environment, our air. All right, what can we do with respect to getting the truth from power? That's a good question. Um, Organize, agitate, write letters to your congressmen. That seems very anemic in the scheme of things here. Um, 
you know, we, we ought to appeal to our media to do a better job. Is the New York Times doing very well on this subject? I do see you know, uh, some in-depth reporting on it, but certainly not commensurate with, with the problem that we're facing. So I'd like to see more of that. I think there's a role for journalism and media to play in this. Um, we need leaders. <laughs> <laughs> Steve? <laughs> I tried. Go ahead, ma'am. <laughs> well, I think I've mentioned many things uh, tonight. I, I don't know if there's much I can add to it. I think the main thing would be do what you feel you can really do and accomplish something with, and uh, uh, but make sure it's something you actually will do and will stick with. So. Um, because it's easy to have resolutions and think about things, and then, you know, often we don't do half the things or even 80% of the things we want to do. So I would say narrow it down. Um, what are the things that you're most passionate about and that you think that you can actually do, and then start doing them and kind of have another, you know, another range of things that you'll do once you get the first thing's done, but get, get some concrete things accomplished and then start expanding your territory of influence. That's what I would say. But whatever, do it rather than just think about it. Okay. I would like if um, each of you would make a final closing statement of your any final thoughts you want to leave us with. I'm kind of blown away by what I've heard here tonight. Um, you know, I only know really of climate change um, from living in this world and reading about it in um, the media, from studying the science of um, ticks and how climate change has um, propelled them around the climate, around the uh, world. Um, I will leave this conference um, with a sense of renewal, that I have to do more in my own little world, as well as in you know, the profession I um, have undertaken for the last 40 years um, to change this situation. The, stake, the fate of the planet is in our hands. I'd just like to say I'm very, very honored to be on this panel with both of you because you've been at this a lot longer than me. And, and just to reiterate what I said earlier, too, that I take heart knowing that there are people like this and, you know, you engaged in different activities on different topics that none of us has time. If we're going to do something and do it really, really well, we have to be focused. And, and I certainly don't have time to do the body of research that you've had to do or that you've had to do. And so I take heart knowing that there's other people out there doing a lot of extraordinary work in this conference and in untold numbers of other conferences like this uh, on different activities and different topics. And so try to find some solace in that because otherwise this is all so utterly overwhelming and just know that take heart in the fact that there's millions of other people out there working really hard for the planet too. And then the thought that I conclude with is just to pass on what helps me is I, I get up each morning and part of my routine is to really ask to be shown how can I be of service to the planet and to her people and carry that spirit in to my activities through the day, whether it's just how I interact with people or, or if it's directly engaged in what I'm working on. And, and, you know, that's going to bring a lot of the right kind of energy into the world right now at a time when the world is in sore, dire need of some better energy. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, too, am, uh, I feel privileged to have been on the panel with both of you, and I've learned a lot. I knew that... Uh, the climate change uh, problem was dire, but I have learned even deeper dimensions of it and feel more stimulated and inspired to uh, become even more engaged. I've also 
it's becoming increasingly clear to me, and I, one of the, the main theme in my talk this afternoon was that uh, how there's a link. I mean, there's similarities between the, uh, the attack on science that's occurring in regard to GMOs, where it's being unfortunately the main assault is being led by elements of the scientific community in league with uh, industrial and corporate interests that actually are, are uh, hurting the planet and uh, doing so many bad things to the environment and sp making the climate situation worse. And uh, that the attack on climate science is also, of course, uh, weakening our ability to intelligently deal with it. But the the people, the, the, the attack on science in regard to GMOs, the people that are promoting GMOs through, dis, uh, uh, through deception and, uh, and attacking science are usually also attacking uh, organics and poo-pooing the notion that we can move away from industrial agriculture. And so it, it's linked up. There's very, there are links. And so it's uh, making me clearer too that by focusing on bringing out the truth about the problems of GMOs and helping bring the demise of agriculture that's based on genetic engineering and moving toward sustainable, healthful solutions that uh, the health of, uh, of the population and the health of our soil, the health of the planet are all being improved because there are deep links. And uh, uh, so anyway, I'm more resolved to continue doing what I'm doing and to uh, spread the education, more educate people as, well, as best as I can. And uh, to also just applaud people like Dar and Mary Beth who are, who are really working on the, uh, the problem in, uh, in other very important ways. And as they've expressed too, Together, with all of us working on what we're doing, uh, I still feel that uh, we can make major solutions and I continue to remain optimistic, but we have to get, we have to stay committed and we have to get going. So, and thanks again to Steve for organizing this conference. And Thank you.